I'm going shell, I'm going well on shell, shell, shell. New Zealand is great, let's see it. Go away, you can't be sure of shell. Well, my left and my, you drive with a smile, nothing but fun on shell, shell, shell. Ah, you can't be sure of shell. From tight, tight of love, I can't see enough. What a wonderful time on shell, shell, shell. Trips be great, hey, fill her up, mate. I'm doing well on Shell. Keep going well, keep going Shell. And you can be sure of Shell. I have frequently been asked if I was born a cricketer. I do not think so because I believe that cricketers are made by coaching and practice. That nerve, eyesight, physique and patience, although necessary, would not be much use alone. There was a quote from one of the all-time great cricketers way back in 1899, W.G. Grace. And that, to me, sums up the philosophy of what the game of cricket is all about. Cricket has been a great part of my life, and I guess I can be very grateful for the opportunities that have come my way. It's allowed me to tour the world to many, many countries now, it's allowed me to play with and against some of the great players in world cricket. And it's allowed me to make many, many friendships and to participate in winning test matches and winning test series for New Zealand. And of course, there's been some many personal magical moments for me as well. But I think one of the great highlights for me is that it's allowed me to represent New Zealand at a sport. And naturally, I'm very proud of that. But to be successful at cricket, it just doesn't happen like that. You've got to have a bright, positive attitude in the game of cricket if you want to succeed. And in doing that, you must set yourself aims and goals. Be specific, set high standards and achieve. It may be that all you want to do is go out there and score 100 for the season, or score a 50 to take five wickets, to represent your province or represent your country. They are specific aims. Go about planning it and go about achieving it. I think it's important too to have confidence. Confidence breeds success, whereas a lack of it is a passport to failure. There are no excuses, so you've got to believe in your ability in any given situation. And it's important also to make the most of opportunities. First, you've got to realise them, then go out there and make the most of them. I mean, an opportunity may be turning up to a practice, turning up to a match. It may be playing in a representative underage tournament. It may be playing for your country. It may be a certain situation. And I remember that the best opportunity that ever came my way when my big brother Dale, unfortunately for him, put his big toe in a lawnmower away back in 1971. That meant that he couldn't play the remaining three first-class games of that season. I was his replacement for Canterbury, did quite well, took a hat-trick and represented New Zealand B in the Tour of Australia that same year. That was an opportunity, well realised, made the most of it, and I often look back and say, what would have happened if Dale hadn't put his toe in a lawnmower? Unfortunate for him, but it was a big important thing for me. Fitness is important, but we'll cover that in more detail a little bit later. But it's important to prepare well mentally and physically. It's very important to enjoy the game. If you don't enjoy it, there's no point playing. It's very important to play the game hard, to compete, but above all, play the game very fairly. Give of your best all the time. It's very important too to praise and encourage teammates. If somebody does something well in the game, scores some runs or takes some wickets, dives and takes a beautiful catch, applaud him pat him on the back. It makes that person feel as though his contribution to the side is an important one. One of the most vital attitudes in the game of cricket is concentration. Very, very important. You must watch every ball, be part of every ball, because if a batsman loses concentration, it's a mistimed shot and he's out, and you can't score runs in the dressing room. If you're a bowler and lose concentration, it's a bad ball, and that's whacked away for four runs. That's an absolute waste in letting the side down. And of course, in the field, if you lose concentration there, it's a misfielded ball and more runs are just given away. Very important to keep concentration all the time. In this video, we'll specifically be looking at fast bowling, but we'll also be covering other aspects of the game as well, such as batting, fielding, wicket keeping, captaincy, selection and maintenance of gear and equipment, and also fitness preparation. And I'll also be joined by a couple of friends as well. And just one more quote. Cricket is a game that caters for youngsters of different physical and mental makeup. It allows for individualism and flair without destroying team spirit. It rewards the trier as well as the gifted, and it teaches patience and fair play. Let's prepare for cricket.
Any sports person wanting to perform to the best of their ability must be physically and mentally fit. Fitness allows for greater efficiency, helps concentration, delays the onset of fatigue and tiredness, and prevents and delays injury. You need to be fit enough so that a fast bowler can finish the day as well as he started, bowling at least 20 overs effectively. A batsman must have enough energy to be able to occupy the crease all day if necessary, and a fielder must be alert and able to chase the ball quickly whenever called upon to do so. Pre-season training starts months before you attempt to bowl a cricket ball, running at least four to five miles five days a week. Remember, it's not a race, it's time on feet. It is vitally important to stretch the body and warm it up before practicing, playing or even before running. The New Zealand cricket team takes 20 minutes to warm up before a practice or the start of a match. All stretching should be done gently. Push and hold for say 20 seconds. Push again just a little bit further and hold. No bouncing because that can cause injury. If for some reason you do get an injury, be sure to attend to the problem quickly. Seek medical advice. For pulled muscles, use the rice treatment. Rest, ice, compression in the way of bandages and elevation. It might take a couple of weeks to get that injury right again. Common bowling injuries are ankle ligaments, Achilles tendons, calf and hamstring muscles, groin and back problems, shoulder and neck. Some batsmen and fielders may suffer from the odd broken or cracked finger. However, most injuries can be avoided once the body is warmed up, particularly before subjecting it to stress. To complement the general running and endurance work, it is important to do sprint work to help stamina, say 10 to 15, 50 to 100 metre sprints. I find that if I lose my bowling rhythm, it is because I'm short of sprint work. I need to do more short sharp sprint work, particularly as the season progresses. It's very important at all times to keep your body warm. Now when you're doing your loosening up exercises in the mornings before the game actually starts, a good idea to train in your tracksuit. Obviously it keeps your whites clean. And for those that are fielding out there, particularly in cold or chilly conditions, not a bad idea to wear a long sleeve sweater as I'm wearing now. And for bowlers, some bowlers like to wear a short sleeve sweater, that's fine, but certainly when you've finished bowling a spell, to make sure you put that sweater back on just to keep you warm. It will prevent chills and injuries and that sort of thing. And also, one final tip for the bowler, make sure you wear an under vest or a singlet of some type. It absorbs the sweat and perspiration, and again, it will prevent injuries and chills in the back. Pre-season training is very important. 
I would strongly recommend that you use a gymnasium at least two or three times a week, and that you seek professional advice and get a program organised to suit your own requirements. What suits me may not suit you. The basic program needs to be well coordinated. Start with the exercise for three minutes to warm up. Then do a series of stretching exercises. The rebounder should be used after each piece of apparatus, say 30 hops each leg. Various pieces of equipment are used for different parts of the body, but remember, use the rebounder after each routine. The size of the weights are important. If you're looking for speed and endurance work, use lighter weights with, say, 15 to 20 repetitions done quickly. For strength work, use heavier weights with, say, 15 to 20 repetitions done more slowly. After the apparatus work has been completed, finish with three minutes on the exercise cycle again, do some more stretching work to cool down. What you want to do a... It may look like hard work, but it can be a lot of fun at these gyms. There are people of all ages, different shapes and sizes. It's quite interesting meeting other sporting people here as well. And we're all here for one specific purpose. That is total fitness, for muscle strength, tone and flexibility. The selection and maintenance of gear and equipment is an aspect of the game that I think we should talk about. There's an old saying in the game of cricket that if you can't be a cricketer, then look like a cricketer. I believe it's very important that you're well dressed, you have clean clothes, clean boots, and make sure that you have all the gear and equipment available for the use during the day. If you feel like a cricketer, then you have a greater chance of performing out in the middle. So let's start from bottom to top with the boots. Bowler's feet need to be trouble free. You need a lightweight leather boot with high ankle support. You need leather soles with a good heel screw-in or built-in studs and uh, for bowlers a drag plate's not a bad idea as well but while we're talking about the bowling boot i think it's also important to talk about the inner sole a molded sole that fits inside the boot here it helps for feet cushioning and makes your feet feel very very comfortable i like the idea of wearing an ankle support as well simply because i've had a lot of ankle trouble particularly on the left foot and uh, this wraps around the ankle there and it gives you greater protection and stops uh, quite a few injuries in that particular area. I think it's also important that bowlers wear at least two pairs of woolen socks. Again, this helps foot cushioning and makes your feet feel very, very comfortable. It's not a bad idea to use foot powder as well to prevent uh, blisters and tinea and make the feet feel very fresh. Sometimes the batsmen and the fielders prefer to use a different type of boot. They use a much lighter boot, it's cutaway ankle support here, and batsmen prefer using spikes on most occasions, but I believe it's very important to use spikes when you're batting, and certainly when you're fielding, particularly when conditions are a little bit greasy, a little bit wet or damp, uh, or the ground is a little bit fresh. There is a tendency for some players, some fielders, some batsmen to use rubber-soled shoes. Well, that's an individual or personal thing, but again, it's very important to make sure that conditions are right so that you don't slip and slide around too often. When batting, I'd always recommend the use of a thigh pad, particularly against fast bowlers, and particularly when the pitch has a little bit of bounce in it. Make sure that it has plenty of padding. On this occasion, it's moulded to fit the thigh. And of course, when you're batting as well, this little piece of equipment here, called the abdominal guard, or the box, must be worn every time you go out and bat, and it's not a bad idea to wear it when you're fielding close in at bat pad as well. It does hurt if you get hit in that particular area. Batting gloves should always be worn when you're batting in the middle. Also wear them at practice as well, particularly when you're having throwdowns. Gloves will help you grip the bat a lot better. Gloves should be comfortable, not too bulky. Solid protection around the thumb and around the fingers area. And it's very important that uh, you wear them all the time. There's nothing worse than getting hit on the fingers and getting bruised and broken fingers. Obviously you can't play the game and bat and score runs if you haven't got your hands well protected. 
It's a good idea having a cricket ball in your bag. Perhaps a couple of them is a good idea, simply because you may need it for practice at throwdowns before you go out there and bat. So just make sure you have at least one or two of these available. And of course, wearing hats, I think, is very important as well. Either a cap or a sun hat it reduces the glare and it can prevent sunburn and sunstroke. Caps never seem to uh, fit me too well, but anyway, still got to be worn. The use of a helmet is very much a personal decision. I think it's now an accepted part of protective equipment. It helps one's batting confidence. I think it's quite important for those that field in the close bat pad position as well. It should be worn against fast bowlers, and particularly when pitch conditions are just a little bit dicey. If you're going to wear a helmet, I also recommend that you use the full visor, as we have here. Otherwise, uh, there's little point in wearing it. You must protect not only the head, but also the face. And it's not a bad idea as well to have a little bag to put the helmet in. It just stops the scratching of the, uh, of the plastic visor here. Batting pads, or leg guards, these are very important part of protective equipment because obviously they protect the legs. They must be comfortable, they must have solid protection, particularly across the knee here and down the front part of the leg. It's not a bad idea at times actually, if you uh, feel as though there's not a lot of protection there, to put an extra piece of foam rubber or something solid in there just to give you that little bit of extra protection. They must be light to allow quick feet movement and easy running between the wickets. But make sure that if you're a right-handed batsman that you use right-handed pads. Conversely, if you're a left-handed batsman, use left-handed pads. The difference there being, of course, is the flap wing here, the side wing, which protects the calf muscle. The bat is the run machine. It's far better to have a bat that's a little bit lighter than one that is far too heavy. There are a couple of points to consider when selecting a bat. Firstly, you've got to decide whether you need a long-handled bat or a short-handled bat. Obviously, if you're a tall player, then a long-handled bat is of more importance to you. If you're a smaller player and have a crouched stance, then you may use a shorter handle bat. There's a difference of about an inch there. Also very important to have a look at the bat to see whether it is, in fact, a left-handed or right-handed bat, the difference here being the shape of the toe. For the bat that I have, which is this one here, it weighs round about three pounds. That suits my requirements. However, with this bat here, it's round about two pound eight. So it's very important to look at the, the balance of the bat, the weight of the bat, and feel comfortable with it. Uh, those are the very important ingredients when selecting a bat. And I also think it's very important to look after it as well. With this particular bat that's got a, what I call a poly coating on it, when it gets a little bit dirty, it's very easy to clean it with a damp rag. Conversely, with this bat here, it's just a straight willow wood grain bat. When it gets a little bit dirty, it needs to be sanded down with sandpaper and then put a little bit of bat oil on it just to keep it working well for you. Now, I have fairly big hands, so when I look at the handle of the bat, I prefer to have a bat handle that has three rubber grips on it, like that. However, some people with smaller hands may prefer to have a much thinner handle with perhaps only one grip on it. And just as a final tip, it's not a bad idea to have a bat cover just to slip your bat into. For the cricketer that wants to be really prepared, I carry a medical kit in my cricket case. All sorts of things are in here. There's my wristbands, there's foot powder, there's a knee bandage, some white nugget to keep the boots clean, something there for the eyes, some suntan cream, a packet of matches, some cards for a rainy day, there's a pen there for signing some autographs, some sandpaper, down here we have a sprig tightener. Something there for the nose. Something there for tinea. That is for things that have or problems that you may have with your feet. Again, another sprig tightener, a screwdriver, some more suntan cream, all sorts of first aid bandages there. Oh, there's all sorts of things. Some pills, cough drops, a shaver for the end of the day. And in there I've got some needles and uh, some cotton and some buttons. There's a knife. Another sprig tightener, spare screws from a helmet, some spare laces, something to keep my rings in. Down here we've got some, some scissors, a bit more tape, a coin just in case the captain forgets and he needs a coin to toss with. Again, another screwdriver, another couple of pens, some more bandages, some chewing gum. More cotton and thread there. You see, there's all sorts of basic oddments there that help me get through a day's play.
Now that we've been through all the gear and equipment, we need to have something to put all the gear in. And there's all sorts of gear bags available. There's this nylon type bag with a zip along the top and with a grip like that. That should get most of your gear in. But for me, I prefer to use the Cricut coffin. It's hard, it's solid, and it should take all pieces of equipment that we've just been through. There we are. Everything fits in nice and easily. And just one final point. It's not a bad idea when selecting your gear and equipment to talk to professionals to get good, sound advice. Talk to senior players, a professional cricketer, a coach or your sports retailer. As you can see, summer is now with us again. Fast bowling is an art. It can be hard work, but it's very, very rewarding as well. A pace bowler must put together an explosive sequence of highly coordinated movements. His action must develop maximum hand speed, it must be mechanically efficient to conserve energy and resist injury. It must be consistent to ensure accuracy and constant pace. A fast bowler must practice regularly, at least three or four times a week, practicing control of line and length, committing the batsman to play at the ball and making possible mistakes. There are variations to holding the ball, but the basic grip for the fast bowler is to have the ball seam up like that, and with these two fingers gripping the ball on either side of the seam with your thumb directly underneath like that. When you grip the ball, you grip the ball loosely, with the pressure points being the first joins of the fingers here, and the thumb directly underneath as I said, but making sure there's a gap between here and here. We don't wish to see the ball too far back, but pushed forward like that. That is the basic grip for the fast bowler. Looking at the grip in close-up, you'll see again how these two fingers here are placed on either side of the seam. Again, the thumb is directly underneath the ball. The third finger is also tucked away, so it's just resting on the bottom of the seam as, uh, as well. Hadley to Marsh. Ball kick very low. He's OBW. Hadley, first ball. Ball keeps a bit low. Bang in front. In. A run up should be measured so that the fast bowler does not run out of steam and can still put everything into the last few strides before delivery without falling over or losing his balance at delivery. Start with your toes or heels on the bowling crease and count the required number of paces back. Too long a run up can be detrimental to your delivery. It may cause you to lose your rhythm. A maximum of 15 paces is ample for any young bowler. Put a marker down so that you know where to start your running from. The run-up should be measured precisely. There should be no need to look at where your feet are going to land at the point of delivery. OK, we're now ready to bowl our first ball at our imaginary batsman down there. This is where our concentration level must come in in its very best. It's very important that you concentrate on where you want that ball to go. There must be a specific target area for you to aim at. For me, it's the base of the off stump. That's what I'm looking at. My eyes are firmly focused on that area. It may be that some bowlers look at the batsman's feet. They may look at a piece of the pitch about four or five uh, feet further in front of the batsman. It doesn't matter what you look at as long as there is something specific. But I also have four key words that go through the back of my mind as I run into bowl. They are rhythm, off stump, Height and Lily. Rhythm because bowling is about rhythm, timing and coordination, being relaxed. Off stump because that's my target area, that's the line I'm looking to bowl at the batsman. Hate because the batsman's an obstacle, he's a problem, he's got to be removed the best way you know how and as quickly as possible. Lily because he's the epitome of what fast bowling's all about, confidence, aggression, a good physique, 
an incredible technique. He moves the ball in the air, he moves it off the seam, he intimidates the batsman, and what's more, he gets him out. And that's what bowling's all about. OK, let's see if we can get one or two down there and see if we can do the job. The run-up may be slightly angled, but most coaches would emphasise a straight approach for fast bowlers. The eye should be firmly focused on where you want the ball to pitch. For the medium pace and fast bowlers, the run-up should be smooth and gradually building up in pace so that you're at your quickest four metres from delivery. The arms should be relaxed and moving rhythmically to help your balance. A fast bowler starts in a slightly crouched or stooping position. As he draws closer to the wicket, he will stand more erect to increase his momentum. The key word here is relaxed. If you're too tense or stiff when running into bowl, there will be no rhythm and you'll find it difficult to bowl accurately. As the bowler approaches the crease, he turns sideways, moving his hips and shoulders to a side-on position. His head is steady, looking over his front shoulder. His eyes are level and firmly focused on where he wants that ball to pitch. His free arm starts to point to the sky to provide balance. If that free arm does not go high enough, he will lose his balance and lean away. It also assists him in aiming. The body weight is now transferred from the back foot to the front foot. The front leg will brace to keep the body in an upright position. If the front leg collapses, just a little bit like my one, then the trajectory of the ball is lowered considerably. The front foot should cut the pop increase. The front foot should point down the pitch or define leg position. As the bowler bowls, he will bowl across his front leg. As the ball is released, the bowling arm cuts across the body and finishes down the opposite side of the body. The bowling arm will come down together with the front arm, which of course is the balance arm. Remember to keep the front arm up as long as possible so that the body is held in an upright position. The follow through is vital to the rhythm of your bowling and cannot be ignored. Remember, a fast bowler has just run in 15 or 20 metres pretty fast, turned sideways and delivered the ball at around about 70 or 80 miles an hour. And of course he cannot just stop, otherwise that would just cause a lot of injury. The body must be allowed to unwind slowly. Generally speaking, a fast bowler should follow through round about four or five metres, a medium pacer, three or four metres. Always run off the pitch as soon as possible. Let's now look at the normal technique again. Side on and the follow through arm coming down the left side of the body. However, some bowlers don't quite get it right. Their bowling arm is just a little bit too low. Get it up high so that when you actually deliver the ball, your bowling arm is nearly touching your ear. That's the technique we are looking to do, looking over your shoulder. Some bowlers tend to look through their, their front arm. And here we've got the front leg collapsing. There it is, side on, both arms coming down together in a freewheeling situation. However, the front arm's gone too quick, you lose your balance and you can fall over. The back foot lands parallel to the bowling crease. If you land your back foot this way, there's a tendency for the body to fall over and you lose your balance. The correct way of placing your front foot when delivering the ball is to have your foot grounded behind the line with your foot facing towards the fine leg position. I have a tendency, however, when I deliver the ball is to actually come down straight, but I tend to swivel around just a little bit and open up. But that's one of the curiosities related to my bowling. However, a lot of bowlers tend to have their foot openly splayed like that, which is the incorrect way. It causes a lot of problems with stress on the ankles and on the knee and can cause a lot of injury problems. Some bowlers, however, also have their foot turned too far around this way. So the ideal way is to have it pointing virtually straight down the pitch with a slight angle towards fine leg. Hadley to Hendrick. Oh, and that was perilously close to the top of the stump. There are several different lengths that a bowler can bowl, but depending on the type of bowler you are, 
and on pitch conditions, these will vary considerably. The long hop is a ball that pitches halfway down the pitch. The batsman will consider it a gift and easy to score from because he can hit the ball almost anywhere in the paddock. He'll probably pull it on the leg side. The long hop should, therefore, not be bowled. The bouncer. The ball pitches about where the long hop does, but it is bowled at extreme pace and lifts awkwardly onto the batsman's chest or head, forcing him to play a rash shot and generally making life unpleasant. It should be used sparingly because it is more effective when there is an element of surprise. Short of a length, the ball pitches nearer the batsman than the long hop. Although it is short of a correct length, it can be used effectively to contain the batsman and on a difficult pitch, it can be a good wicket taker. The good length ball, the ball is directed either on or just outside the off stump. This is the length that bowlers should be looking at to bowl consistently. It should be the stock ball. The over pitch delivery or the half volley, the ball pitches beyond a good length. Every batsman is looking for one of these because it invites an easy scoring shot off the front foot. The batsman looks to hit the ball as it pitches. But the half volley can also be a wicket taking ball when a new batsman is at the crease, especially when the ball is swinging or seaming. The batsman may not quite get his front foot to the pitch of the ball and he may edge it to the slips or mistime it and loft it into the outfield. The Yorker. The ball pitches right at the batsman's feet. It is a good wicket-taking ball and can easily take a batsman by surprise. He may play directly over the top of it, allowing the ball to crash through to his stumps or get caught in front LBW. The Yorker should be bowled with extreme pace. It is a very good ball to bowl when the batsman is looking to score quick runs because no one can score many, if any, runs from a Yorker. However, it is a very difficult ball to bowl because the margin of error between the Yorker and the full toss is not great. The right length to bowl depends on pitch conditions, the height and reach of the batsman and the ball. A good length ball is one that makes the batsman hesitate whether to play back or forward with the possible result that he remains out of position long enough to make a possible mistake. By bowling a good length ball, the bowler has the best chance of obtaining a wicket. If the wrong length or line is bowled, then the batsman has the advantage. Well, watch the outswinger from the champion medium fast bowler Hadley. Well up to the batsman, turning away. Randall coming forward, outside edge, and Jeremy Corney was there. Now let's look at the grip for the outswinger. Again, the seam is up as it is. Your two fingers come across like that, but then all of a sudden you tilt the seam of the ball pointing towards first slip. Must also make sure that the shiny side of the ball, which is this one here, is on the outside, on the right side of you. So that there is the basic grip for the outswinger. When bowling the outswinger, it's very important that you get very close to the wicket. As I do here, you turn side on by rotating your hips round like this. Your front arm goes up high, so you're looking over your shoulder with your head straight and still and your eyes level. And when you come over, up high, like that, over and down the left side of the body, that'll give you a chance of getting the ball to move away like that. So let's look at the grip for the inswinger. The shiny side of the ball is on the left side, or the inside. Again, you hold the ball seam up, place the fingers down the seam, move it slightly that away, so that the seam of the ball is in fact facing the leg slip position, or the fielder down there at fine leg. We're trying to bowl the inswinger. We're going to come a lot wider of the crease, in a more open position. We're going to bowl from about here, we're going to be more chest on, and we're probably going to look through here, and the arm action will come to here like that, down to here, and the ball will have a chance of moving in towards the batsman. Bob Willis thrusting forward at this one. The important aspect of swing bowling is that when the ball comes out of the hand, the wrist must be cocked like that. All right? It must be absolutely cocked and still. The thing about seam bowling is that the wrist comes into play. So if we're going to try and bowl the, the leg cutter, for example, the fingers will actually roll down 
the left side of the ball here, like that, okay? You're using your wrist action. And that is out. A fine catch by Jeff Crow at slip. Oh, that's a marvellous delivery from Headley. Pitching, cutting away. Tavre not mo moving his feet at all. Edges it. Trying to bowl the off cutter, the, ball, the fingers will actually move down the right side of the ball, cutting across the seam, so you have that sort of movement. Bowling! He just stood on the crease and it kept a little low on him and went through him. The slower ball can be bowled differently, either by slowing the arm action down at delivery, a change of grip, or a combination of both. Or maybe you decide to deliver the ball from a different position, that is one or two feet further back from where you'd normally bowl it from. Allen's to Crow. Confident appeal for an LBW, and that always looked out. Let's look at the different grips. This is the basic grip. Now we may decide to move the position of the thumb, either further under the ball and around the other side, or move the thumb further up the other side of the ball. The three fingers here come into play. We want the ball to come out of this area, a little bit like an off-break delivery. It sort of rolls out of this area. With this type of delivery, the finger is tucked away. Two fingers are held across the seam, the thumb is halfway positioned. The ball is flicked out of the hand with this finger. And with this variation, the ball is certainly held well back in the palm of the hand. It's held a bit like a hand grenade. The ball comes out of the palm area instead of the fingers. It is pushed out of the hand. There are common faults in bowling not having a consistent and gradually accelerating run-up that allows for a good takeoff from the left foot to give you height at delivery. Gripping the ball too tightly, which tends to drag the ball down the pitch. Lack of concentration, not having your eyes firmly fixed on where you want the ball to land for a good line and good length. Not landing with the back foot parallel to the bowling crease, with the hips and shoulders not turning sideways. Insufficient lean back at delivery, away from the batsman. Rocking motion allows for greater pace and control. Bowling off the wrong foot, complete lack of rhythm, timing and coordination. The front arm's not high enough, causing the bowler to lose his balance and fall away at delivery. The head moves instead of remaining still and level. The eyes should be looking straight down the pitch over the front arm. With faster bowlers, the head is slightly angled to allow the bowling arm to reach its highest point. The front foot lands too wide of the wickets and is openly splayed, pointing to gully instead of pointing down the pitch. No follow through, thus losing rhythm falling over in delivery stride, and this loses balance and control. The fielding positions for the new and old ball will vary accordingly. Obviously it depends on the bowler's form, how the pitch is playing, the batsman's technique, and the overhead weather conditions. But generally speaking, the following fielding positions will apply. The emphasis here is making the ball move away from the batsman, and at times it moves quite sharply, either in the air or off the pitch. Therefore, we are attempting the batsman to play at the ball on or about the off stump, possibly edging it into a well-guarded slips gully cordon. By leaving a vacant mid-off, the batsman may attempt to drive at the ball through that area. We want him to do that, because if the ball deviates, he could edge it. There will be less movement with the older ball. Two slips in a gully is quite sufficient here. A third man is generally employed as a run-saving position, it's better to give away a single than four runs when the ball is angled down through that area. It's often quite frustrating for a bowler to give away those extra runs. Other fielders are generally employed or positioned to save runs. Here the ball tends to swing and seam into and down the legs of the left-hand batsman. Therefore, a leg slip or gully is positioned along with the bat pad. The emphasis is placed on the leg side field with four men on the offside. Bowling with the older ball to the left-hand batsman, 
Again, there will be less movement. The bowler will concentrate on attacking the off stump. Five men are therefore positioned on the offside, four on the leg side with a couple of attacking fielders ready for possible catches. The new ball moves in towards the batsman, either in the air or off the seam. A couple of slips and a gully are employed. However, the emphasis here is on a leg side field with two close in catching men and with a mid on and a mid wicket positioned as run savers. As the ball gets older, his bowling line will change to on or about off stump. Five men are positioned on the offside and four on the onside. The ball is moving away from the left hander quite sharply because of the seam, swing, and angle. Plenty of catching men are positioned in the slips cordon. A 6 3 offside field is set. Again, as the ball gets older, we get a little more defensive. A third man is positioned. Two slips and a gully remain to catch. The offside fielders prevent the singles, and the three men on the leg side do the same thing. Bowling techniques will vary considerably depending on shape, size and movement, but at the end of the day, it's where the ball lands that really counts. Now I've got a good technique, but there are still one or two deficiencies. But I have been successful simply because I've bowled within limitations, and I think. Hadley. Nipping back to Jeff Thompson and he's out LBW. And let us watch Richard Hadley here now. Pitching just outside off stump, nipping back and hitting him right in line with middle. Hadley. And he's edged it behind and he's out. Caught behind. Oh, and that's a catch. Watch the bouncer. Absolutely in line with his body. He can't get out of the way. Pushes the left arm forward, gloves him, and Smith is there, waiting for it. The bowler's job is to get the batsman out. Therefore, the bowler must be constantly analysing a batsman's technique and the pitch conditions. As far as the batsman is concerned, he must sort out his weaknesses very, very quickly and then attack him in that area. He must use the pitch conditions and the weather conditions to his favour. If, for example, a fast bowler is bowling on a hard, green, fast, bouncy pitch, he will enjoy that. But if, however, it's bare of grass, low and slow in pace, he must be prepared to bowl differently. The important points to remember when bowling, control of line and length, keep sideways as long as possible, keep your head still, think and look where you want the ball to pitch, vary your pace and the flight of the ball, use the crease to change the angle of delivery, follow through after each delivery, always run off the pitch and not on or down it, know your own field placements, consult your captain if you need any field changes, keep your cool, be in control of your mind, don't become too frustrated and overreact if decisions go against you or if the batsman is taking the initiative. The accomplished batsman has good ball sense. He has the ability to pick up the line and length of the ball very quickly and is able to deal with it effectively. A player with all those abilities and skills is former New Zealand cricket captain and scorer of five test centuries, Mark Burgess. Thanks for joining us, Burge. What's the first thing we do when we go out to bat? We take guard paddles. Well, you do that, and I'll go and measure out my runner. Right. The batsman arriving at the wicket needs to know where he is positioned in relation to the stumps so that he can best sight the ball. The usual guard position has the batsman's head in line with the middle stump and his eyes level, but the placement of his bat may vary from middle stump depending on his height or his style of playing. The guard taken may depend upon the type of bowler and the pitch conditions. In asking the umpire for the guard, hold the bat in the upright position. For the middle guard, the face of the bat points towards the square leg umpire. In taking the two legs or the middle and leg guard, the face of the bat shows to the umpire at the bowler's end. Once the correct guard has been obtained, mark it on the batting crease with the edge of your bat or a boot spike. Then position your feet on that mark. To help you get the feel of the right grip, lie the bat face down on the ground in front of you with your legs apart. Pick the bat up as if you are picking up an axe. That is the grip for batting. The hands are as close together as possible on the bat handle and just over halfway up the handle. The top hand should grip the bat very firmly while the bottom hand grips it more loosely. Fingers and thumbs lie well around the handle and the V's are formed with the top and bottom hands. The first finger and the thumb of the top hand are directly over the corresponding V of the bottom hand. The line of these V's is between the splice and the outer edge of the bat. 
The top hand of the bat is allowed to rest against the thigh on the front leg. The top hand should point in the direction of mid-off and extra cover. However, there are a couple of common faults in gripping the bat. The hands are too far apart. The hands are too far over the top. The hands are too far underneath. There's the reverse grip. All these restrict batting. Some faults are caused by having a bat that's far too heavy or far too big. The stance should be relaxed in the batsman's position so that he can best pick up the line and type of ball and play it. The body, sideways with the head looking over the front shoulder towards the bowler. The head, straight and still with the eyes level. The head should not be allowed to bob up and down when playing at the ball because by keeping his head straight and still, the batsman may be in the best sight to judge the line and length of the ball and how to play it. The feet, a comfortable distance apart, either side of the bat increase, 75 to 150 millimetres apart or approximately six inches. The body weight must be evenly spread between the feet, never on the heels because this will restrict movement. The back foot should be parallel to the bat increase while the front foot can be parallel or slightly opened, pointing towards cover. The knees are slightly bent and relaxed to help quick movement. The bat. Most batsmen prefer to have the toe of the bat grounded behind the back foot with the face of the bat pointing towards the pads and the hands resting on the front thigh. Common faults with the stance. The feet are too far apart, preventing quick initial movement. The stance is too open. This will lead to a crooked back lift and will make it difficult to lead with the shoulder into strokes on the offside. The head may be badly positioned and not facing down the wicket. With the head held on an angle, the eyes are not level and it's difficult to focus on the ball. Again, the head may not be in line with the stumps or it is too far over on the offside and it may cause the batsman to lose his balance. To give the batsman the best chance of hitting the ball straight, the bat must be picked up straight and directly behind. Both hands are used in picking up the bat, the top hand dominating. The front elbow bends and the wrist cocks so that the face of the bat opens up and points towards point. At the top of the back lift, the front hand wrist will almost be level with the front arm elbow. The bottom hand wrist will be higher than the front elbow and the bottom elbow will also be bent. Control of the top hand is vital. Both hands should be pushed back. This will ensure that the front shoulder is still pointing towards the bowler. Against faster bowlers, the back lift will have to be picked up a lot sooner than against the slower bowlers in order to give the batsman more time to play his shot. But be careful of the Yorker, which may not give you time enough to bring the bat down. There are common faults with the back lift. The bottom hand taking too much control. The bottom hand elbow being higher than the wrist so that the face of the bat cannot be open. And picking up the bat too late and having to hurry the shot. Lead with the head and front shoulder towards the ball. The front foot must be far enough forward with the toe pointing in the direction of the intended shot. Bend the front knee. The full face of the bat makes contact with the ball. The top hand controls the bat while the bottom hand guides the bat. Take a step back and across in front of the stumps, getting your body well behind the line of the ball. Pick your bat up high enough to play the ball down. Keep sideways to the line of the stroke. Keep your head and balance of the body forward when making contact with the ball. The top hand controls the bat so that the ball is hit downwards. The bottom hand is gripped loosely with the thumb and finger grip. Keep your elbow high. To overpitch deliveries, attacking shots are played off the front foot e.g. the off-drive, cover drive, the straight non-drives. They are all the extension of the forward defensive shots with the addition of the hands pushing through the line of the ball. Remembering to put your front foot to the pitch of the ball. The front leg is well bent, head and shoulders are in line with the ball and positioned where the ball is to be hit. Sometimes the wrists follow through and come into play at the completion of the shot. Always remember to be well balanced and with your weight well forward. The attacking shots played off the back foot include the straight, cover, on and off drives. These shots are played to a ball pitching short of a length. 
The back foot moves back and across in front of the stumps. The back leg is well braced. As the ball hits the bat, the front foot has eased itself onto the toes. The body is side on, the weight is slightly forward. The head is behind the line of the ball, the front elbow is held high. The top hand controls the bat, the power of the shot comes from the hands accelerating and the wrists uncocking just before contact with the ball. What advice would you give a, a young batsman? I mean, what are you looking for when you go out to bat? Well, you, uh, you need to know what the overhead conditions are, the pitch conditions, what the bowlers have been doing, which uh, batsmen have been struggling against certain uh, types of bowler. So uh, you need to know what's going on and have a plan in mind before you go out there. The square cut is played to a short and wider ball. The back foot moves back and across to outside the line of the off stump. The body weight is transferred to the back leg, there's a high back lift, and every effort is made to hit down on the ball, with the bottom hand rolling over the top hand to keep the ball down. The late cut is basically the same as the square cut, but it is more of a dab shot played a lot later than a full-blooded attacking shot. So let's say an outswinger is uh, moving the ball away, how would you look to play an outswing bowler? Well, an outswinger is probably the most difficult bowler to play. So um, a very important thing is to, to know exactly where your off stump is and therefore where the ball is in relation to the off stump. And um, a, a good idea I always found was to let as many balls go from the outswinger early in the innings as, as possible because uh, moving away from the bat is, uh, makes it very much easier to get a fine edge and to uh, get caught behind. But uh, apart from leaving the ball as often as possible, um, I look to play the ball basically back to the bowler himself. And the natural swing and movement on the ball would take it out into the, into the cover area. But by playing back up the pitch and tr essentially trying to knock the stumps out at the other end, you, uh, you find you're uh, playing up and down the line more so than if you're uh, actually trying to hit the ball out to uh, cover extra cover area. The pull and hook shots are played to a short rising ball, basically off the back foot. Pick up the line of delivery quickly, keep your eye on the ball. Move the back foot across the stumps and pivot the body. Contact with the ball is made with a cross bat motion with the arms at full stretch. The body weight is over the back foot. The hook shot is generally played in the air and hit behind square leg. The pull shot is hit flatter and usually in front of square leg, with the wrist rolling over the bat to keep the ball down. The leg glance can be played off the front foot or the back foot. To a short ball outside the leg stump, it is played off the back foot. If the ball is over pitched, then the front foot leg glance is played. The feet must be placed inside the line of the ball. Wait for the ball to come onto the bat. Keep your head and the top of the bat over the line of the ball at the point of contact. Again, use your wrist to control the bat, keeping the ball down. Just watch how the legs cross each other. This shot is an extension of the attacking driving shots, making sure that the front foot gets to the pitch of the ball. The head is still, the body is as side on as possible, the body weight is always forward to help keep the ball on the ground. Playing the bouncer. It certainly isn't easy. There are two methods though, either ducking under the ball or swaying out of the way. But whatever happens, always keep your eye on the ball. Some of the common faults in batting are as follows. Poor grip, too much bottom hand causing the ball to be hit in the air. Not enough back lift. The body's not side on. The body weight is not forward. The head positioning is poor. Foot not to the pitch of the ball. There's a gap between bat and pad. Insufficient foot movement causing loss of balance. Poor arm extension when playing at the ball and not enough wrist movement. Poor concentration, playing the wrong shot to the ball actually bowled. What about building an innings? Well, I, um, thinking back to first class cricket, I always used to believe that I've, if I gave the bowlers the first hour, which is to go out there and, and have a look and see, uh, get the pace of the pitch um, and just sort things out. Um, have uh, shots allocated for certain types of bowlers, certain delivery, 
so that I, I played some and not others to uh, preserve my uh, wicket for so, that first hour. So obviously you can't hit every ball for four? Not at all, no. You, uh, if you look at the, uh, the score sheet afterwards, there are a very low percentage of balls actually get hit for, uh, for four, but you can still score off uh, good deliveries if, you're, if you've got good technique and you're patient. Concentrate on every ball that is bowled and play the correct shot accordingly. Occupy the crease as long as you can and build an innings. Play the innings that the team and the captain requires. Analyse the pitch conditions and see what the bowler is trying to do before attempting to play many shots. Watch the ball in the bowler's hand from the time that he starts his run-up until the ball hits the middle of the bat. Analyse the field placement so that you can see where possible runs can be scored. Look to see where the best fielders are positioned and don't take chances with them. When playing an attacking stroke, there is one definite step forward or back, not both. Don't get caught halfway. The top hand controls the bat. Don't let the bottom hand push forward in front of the bat to cause an ear shot when contact is made. Keep the head still and the eyes level at all times. Don't lift your head. Pick up the line of the ball and position the body inside it, with the exception of the cross bat shots, such as the sweep, cut, pull or hook. Where possible, keep the ball on the ground and hit in the air only when you have confidence and ability to hit over the top of the field to the boundary. Don't take the fielder on if he's positioned on the boundary because he will invariably catch you out. Mark Burgess has a very sound technique. His batting style, flair and ability is very much an individual one though. There's never been a perfect cricketer, there never will be. And whilst we try and reach a certain stage of perfection, we must always be flexible and natural in our batting technique and our approach. We must always adapt to the conditions that are there. Let's now look at running between the wickets. It's very important for the two batsmen to communicate well, to look for the short, sharp single, to turn the ones into twos, the threes into fours and so on. Very important to keep the scoreboard ticking over. There's nothing worse than being run out. In fact, it's got to be the worst possible way of getting out in the game of cricket. First delivery from Hadley. A loud appeal for an LBW. And he looks as though he could be run out. He will be, or someone will be. It's a tremendous fiasco going on out there. And in the end, Border is run out. When batting, there are only three calls in the game of cricket. Yes, no, and wait. If there's a chance of a run, it's yes. If there's no chance of a single, it's no. If there's indecision, it's wait, followed by a yes, no, positive call. Let's now look at the other aspects of running between the wickets. Always run the first run hard. You never know when that one could be turned into a second run. The non-striker should always be backing up. Always slide the bat into the crease, at least a metre or so before you get there. Remember, it is out if your bat is over the line and is in the air. There are several other very important things to consider when running between the wickets. A person running to the danger end always calls for the second run. And when running between the wickets, the batsman should turn facing the ball. He's in a better position to view the ball and the fieldsman. The non-striker stands wide and runs on the outside of the striker. Always look for quick singles and keep runs coming. Watch the fielding side to see who has a good throwing arm or is quicker in the outfield than others. It is always dangerous to run to miss fields, so use discretion here. And finally, the quality of shot doesn't necessarily guarantee that a run will be scored. Put it through the... Oh, brilliant catch! Absolutely flew across the ground. There he is. And look at that. Incredible. An amazing take by Burgess. Just one hand, one of those that stick, and he took it. Could be out here. He's getting under it. Hadley takes the catch. A beauty! Unbelievable catch from Richard Hadley on the ball. Well Richard Hadley. And what a oh, he has had. Very high class seam bowling, ball lifting, cutting away, outside edge, and to that man, Corny. It's in the bank. There's an old adage in the game of cricket that catches win matches. And a good fielding side develops team unity and spirit and harmony. It can be thrilling and exciting to watch a superb fielding team in action, to see the brilliant catch, 
a dive to stop a four or to cut off a certain single, to chase, to retrieve, turn and throw the ball over the stumps into the wicketkeeper's gloves and an unsuspecting batsman is run out. In fielding, the concentration level has to be total. Just imagine that every ball is going to come your way. He must be fit, alert and agile. The fielder should watch the ball all the way into his hands and let his hands give with the ball when catching. Ideally, the player taking the catch is placed so that he is well balanced, with both feet on the ground, directly under the line of the ball, and where possible, catching the ball at eye level. You may sometimes have to take a running catch. Move swiftly, get into the best possible position you can, and then good luck. When fielding close to the wicket, that is in the bat pad position or in the slips or gully area, it's very important to be in a crouched, relaxed position, similar to this here, with your hands or arms resting on your knees but your hands out in front of you. Very important to be round about the position you're in now. A lot of fielders will actually stand too high. If you do that, it's too difficult to get down and stop the ball. If you're in this position, it's easier to go down and it's easier to come up. Let's just try and catch a few. Always let the ball come to you and come up with the ball as well. Hands cupped again, but very relaxed. Move to the ball, make sure you get your body behind it. When fielding in the outfield, there are three methods of stopping the ball. But the most important thing is you must get some part of your body behind the line of the ball, so that if you miss it, your body will stop it and extra runs will not be scored. So there's this method here, using one foot behind the line of the ball, like that. There's forming this V here, with the two feet, so they can stop the ball in here. And then there's the long barrier method, like this here, making sure that there is no gap between this area here and you've got plenty of room here for the ball to be stopped. We know that cricket's a side-on game. Bowlers have to get side-on to deliver the ball, batsmen have to bat side-on. And when throwing the ball, that's no exception as well. But one of the important things to remember about throwing is the actual grip of the ball. It's very important to grip it across the seam, and that will prevent the ball from swinging. You know, it's got a better chance of going a lot straighter. If you grip it that way, the ball will actually swing away from its target. So grip it across the seam. You must line up your target, turn side on to it, and point in the direction where the ball is going to go. And then bring your arm back, and then you just let it go from side on here, from low down, like that, okay? Some will actually throw over from over the top. There's nothing wrong with that, but most players will tend to throw from here, and away she goes. And don't forget the follow through. Okay, back and let it go and a bit of a follow through. When chasing and retrieving the ball, run hard, perhaps a bit quicker than me. Pick up the ball, turn, aim and then throw quickly and directly to the keeper or over the stumps or in this case hit it. How's that? Always concentrate hard. Think the ball is coming your way. Be prepared. Keep your eyes on the ball. Attack the ball in the field. Get into line. Have a second line of defence. Get the ball into the air quickly when throwing. Line up your target area and grip the ball across the seam. When catching, hands are cupped, catching the ball where possible at eye level and bring the ball into the chest area. Fielders should be backing up and moving in with the bowler. Watch the captain for minor field changes. to Tavare. Ah! And that's a ball for a catch behind. Ah! Bill from the New Zealanders, yes. Fred Goodall gives him out. He's bowling to Bright. Ah! Ray Bright has exited. He's out, caught behind. Ian Smith, New Zealand wicketkeeper and record holder for most dismissals in the history of New Zealand Test cricket. Tell me, Ian, what are the qualities of a competent wicketkeeper? Well, Richard, I regard wicketkeeping as a specialist position, so therefore there are some special qualities involved. First of all, I think you've got to have a relatively good level of fitness. You've got to be very agile, 
Uh, you've got to have good movement in all aspects of your body. Your feet are just as important as your hands, I feel anyway. And of course, you've got to have that real desire to do it because it is a specialist position and there's only one in every team, of course. There's, there's no room for any complacency. It's hard work, but you've really got to want to do it. Oh, and that's a catch. A beautiful bouncer from Hadley. Gets Kadir on the gloves and Smith takes the catch behind. How can a wicketkeeper assist a bowler? Well, Richard, I've always regarded a wicketkeeper and a bowler as a very vital partnership to the side. I think that a uh, wicketkeeper's got a lot to offer a bowler because he has the opportunity of standing a lot closer to the batsman who's on strike. He can see the look in his eyes, he can see the expression on his face, he can see when he's struggling to certain types of deliveries, and he should be able to relate that back to the bowler in between overs, you know, at the end of a spell, whatever. Something for the bowler to think about and work on next time round. So a wicketkeeper's just not there to stop the ball. He's got to communicate with his bowlers, his fielders, and with his captain. Oh, course. he has to be the chief communicator in the field. I mean, you know, six hours, seven hours in the field sometimes on a hot day, he has to be the guy motivating everybody. He has to be the keenest person on the field. He has to set the standard that everyone revolves around. He communicates with his bowlers, he communicates with his fielders. He encourages, and every now and then he, he gets stuck into them for things they aren't doing quite so well. What about wicket-keeping gloves there, Ed? Well, these wicket-keeping gloves, have, uh, these are the ones I've used for, for most of last season, Richard, and as you can see, they're starting to, they've seen better days. But uh, I regard your wicket-keeping gloves uh, as high as a batsman would regard his bat, I would imagine. They're just an extension of your hands. They serve as protection for your hands, and you have to look after them in that regard. Uh, you know, it's like going into the shop and buying a bat. You don't buy the prettiest bat. You don't buy the best-looking one. You don't buy that bat because a certain player uses it. You buy the slight like buying wicket-keeping gloves. You buy the ones that are most comfortable, the most practical, not necessarily the most expensive or the most glossy, but the ones that are going to do the best job for your hands. So you don't want them too big and bulky. You don't want them big and bulky. You don't want them too small. You want them to be a snug fit, just like any other gloves that you'd be wearing for any other purpose. And of course, the inner gloves are important as well. Well, they are protection. for bowlers of pace, Richard. Of course, <laughs> yes, they add that little bit extra of protection throughout a long day. They absorb a bit of sweat and they, they stop the gloves or the leather work inside the wicket-keeping gloves actually rotting. So they've got two or three purposes, but mainly for protection and a little bit more comfort throughout the day. See how he gets spoon on the front foot, looking for the ball, and it's not there. It has gone past the bat. And one of the interesting things, of course, is your pads. You've got uh, very small pads, lightweight pads. Obviously, uh, you don't want pads to impede you at all. No, that's right. The, the idea of these wicket-keeping pads, of course, is that they're very, very light, and they are small. They don't they only protect you from the knee down, basically. In other words, uh, you know, they're not there to stop the ball. They're there as a safeguard in case the ball gets past your hands. Your hands are your chief uh, weapons, I suppose, or your chief armament when you come to wicket-keeping. These things have got to be very, very light because you are moving around, you're moving up to the wickets, you're moving side to side all the time, and it's vital that they're light and they're not the batting variety, and I think you'll find that most teams have got these, this kind of pad anyway. And quite important to wear a box as well. Anyway. Well, I've got one on now, Richard. I always, it's the first thing I put on every day. In fact, I, you know, at the start of a test match day, I'll warm up in a box because it's just something I've got used to having on, and it's become a habit for me putting a box on because I used to feel embarrassed talking about it, but you only have to get hit once or twice to know that the embarrassment's worth it. Ian Smith, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Clipping this behind, and Cairns going for a quick through turn, and he looks as though he's run out. Cairns having to make a little bit of ground, but not very much. Whistles it in, and Chapel caught short of his ground. Dyson looking round there. The stance of the wicketkeeper, he takes a pace from behind the stumps. His left foot is in line with the middle stump, and his right foot is outside the line of the off stump. He should be relaxed, head still, eyes level. Body weight on the balls of the feet, Gloves open-faced on the ground, be balanced and relaxed at all times, ready for quick movement. The movement of the wicketkeeper should be up and across in a semicircle behind the stumps and not backwards. The wicketkeeper should run quickly to the wickets when necessary. Take the ball over or to the side of the stumps, depending on the accuracy of the return. You only need to break the stumps when there's a good chance of a run out or a stumping. When standing back to a fast bowler, always move quickly in behind the line of the ball. Gloves facing down with palms open, ready to catch the ball. A wicketkeeper must be alert, energetic, have good concentration, set the fielding standard, communicate with the bowler, assist with the angles and placement of the field with the captain. Don't forget to tape your fingers. That will prevent breakages. Stay down until the ball is pitched and then come up with the ball, letting your hands give with the ball when catching it. Oh, that was a good ball. There's a big appeal and he's out. 
Somebody has to lead the side. He's the captain. He may be the most experienced player, he may be the best player, and he may be the oldest player, but they are not of vital importance. Somebody who has captaincy skills is John Wright. Nice to see you, John. Tell me, what makes a good captain? Well, I think there are several factors, Richard. The first one is respect. You've got to have the respect of your players, and that comes with playing and being part of the team for a number of years. You have to be a positive communicator. You've got to learn to be able to get the best out of your players, get to know them. You've got to have a sound tactical knowledge of the game. That comes through playing the game regularly, many years of experience. I think my county cricket career stood me in good stead. You have to ensure that your players have a positive attitude towards the game. They've got to get out there and they've got to want to play and compete. The other thing that you must do is lead by example, and that means playing at 120% every day and ensuring that the side is well disciplined both on and off the field. Should a captain be involved in team selection? I think it's imperative because really when you go out on the park you want those ten guys underneath you playing for you and they've got to know that you believe in those players and if you can have an input into their selection I think it helps. And when you're going out to toss, say if you win the toss, what are you looking to do? Well, a, it depends on many things. I mean, uh, when we've tossed in New Zealand and it's a bit green, we, we generally put them in because we, we hope that you're going to knock a few over early. But, you know, in India, there's no problem. You go out there, there's no grass, you throw the coin up and uh, you bat. What does captain look for in the batting order? Well, I think you want a solid start, so you want openers that are going to go in and take the shine off the new ball. Preferably your next best player or your best players are at three and four. And uh, generally, you try and get a batting order that complements uh, the players around each other. And your rounder bats around about 6-7 and the wicketkeeper to follow and your bowler sort of bat towards the end of the order? Ideally. I mean, it's great to have someone in test cricket that can bat six and, and play as a batsman but can still contribute a few overs. And then, I mean, we've been lucky. Uh, number seven, yourself coming in, Ian Smith, John Bracewell, good batters. Uh, you know, the lower you can bat, the better it is. I think it's very important that cricketers, no matter where they, they bat, learn to bat and apply themselves when they're at the wicket. And depending on the state of the game, you may look to change the order? Yes. I mean, if you want someone to go out there and hang around, there are particular players that are more suited to that. And then you might want quick runs, and so you'll get the guys in that can put the ball around the field. What sort of spells would you use your bowlers in? The quick bowler, the medium pace bowler, and say the spin bowler? Well, I firmly believe that you've got to use your fast bowler in short, sharp spells so that he's always fresh and that if you need him to knock someone over, he can come on and he's reasonably fresh to do it. You can't over bowl your, your quick strike bowler and then you've got your medium paces and they must bowl in longer spells perhaps into the wind and they do the donkey work and then of course if you've got quality spinners well I think that's tremendous because spinners are a great attacking type of bowler and they can also tie up an end so you, you generally uh, rotate those bowlers in such a fashion whereby you're putting pressure on the batsman as much as possible and looking to get wickets. Now a captain while in the field is always occupied with the game. He's always analysing techniques, I suppose, and the state of the match. What sort of things do you concentrate on there to bring about a wicket? Well, I think that uh, looking at a batsman's uh, temperament, how he's, how he's looking, uh, does he look confident? Uh, is he in good nick? And I like to put pressure on batsmen early, particularly, uh, you know, if you've got a couple of wickets, because the game tends to go in spells, and uh, if you can get that breakthrough and then get another one quickly afterwards, then you can find the game going your way. And you mustn't let a game drift, and uh, that's why it's important that you rotate your bowlers properly. Sometimes things go a little bit wrong, John, in the middle with um, players not quite responding or doing the right thing. How do you handle discipline in the side? Well, a, a good few strong words. I think, uh, you know, players have a commitment to the side. They're out there. There's nothing worse than playing with uh, a long side, someone who you know that's not putting in, and it's terrible for team spirit. You've got to have guys on the park that are playing 120% for six hours a day. They've got to be out there competing. As captain, what's your most memorable moment? Well, I think uh, leading New Zealand, the first time you led the side out into the field had to be a great thrill, but the match I'll always remember was the second test uh, against India in Bombay. We weren't expected to win the match and conditions didn't really suit us and uh, we looked like losing that match on two or three occasions and the guys held together for five days and it was a tremendous team effort and uh, it was great to be part of it. Uh, you know, it was a great thrill, particularly when you were New Zealand captain. John Wright, thank you very much. Through the length of this video, we've covered quite a lot. 
take this video is designed for you to watch time and time again to actually comprehend all the aspects of this marvelous game and in summarizing we've looked at attitude we've looked at fitness bowling batting fielding wicket keeping there's some thoughts on captaincy running between the wickets and selection and maintenance of gear and equipment some parts of the game will be far more important to you than other aspects. However, the basic principles include practicing and working hard, and as often as possible, having good concentration, good disciplines, and being dedicated. It doesn't matter at what level you play, as long as you participate, give you your best, and above all, enjoy it. Now, I've had some wonderful memories from this game of cricket. I've tried to help you, and now it's up to you to apply yourself and get what you want out of this great game of cricket.